This one's going to be filled with lots of information, so pay attention. The Marxist denounced 1848 revolutions as a betrayal of the working class ideas by the bourgeoisie that was indifferent to the legitimate demands of the proletariat. Bourgeoisie did not give a fuck. Uh, U of L said we need bourgeoisie for democracy. Not sure if you can make middle class give a fuck about people that don't have. I don't know if you can make people that have give a fuck about people that don't have. I don't know if you can do that. They should just, if they have a heart and if they're truly Christian, they should. Um, but it, a lot of times there's a lot of indifference. And there was indifference in 1848 just like there's indifference today. For nationalists, 1848 was a springtime of hope when newly emerging nationalities rejected the old multinational empires. With the rise of the Occupy Wall Street movement, liberals and non-Tea Party members, John Stewart and Stephen Colbert fans, are starting to see themselves for the first time and we're realizing that we are in the vast, overwhelming majority. We're the 99% and that our power is beyond our comprehension. It may even encourage multinationalism, so a multinational nationalism, almost like an anti-nationalism. Um, not just white America, but rainbow America, the rainbow rebellion. We have lots of immigrants and cultures and peoples and we should celebrate our similarity we all born here we all unite with freedom and the constitution and democracy and at the same time we recognize our differences our wonderful beautiful uh, better differences not white I'm bohemian I'm Bavarian I'm Prussian I'm African and I'm Austrian okay so African, Austrian, Bohemian, Bavarian, Prussian. I think that's all five. Okay, so uh, Bohemian, Bavarian, Prussian, Austrian, African. Uh, that's that's what I am. Don't even don't even try to call me white. Does, does this look white to you? If if this is white, then then what color? What color is not the lines? But what color is this? If this is white, what color is that? That the same color? I hope it don't look the same. On, on camera because it's not it's not really the same <laughs> here maybe beige maybe peach you can call me peach beige somebody said pink I think there's a little pinkness to it there's an orange too a little yellow and there's a bunch of different colors there's a uh, and I got freckles too so there's a uh, you know I got dark brown pigmentation so actually part of my original heritage my original man is still there I'm 11% African so so perhaps that's the African part of me it's where the curls in my hair come from so, so we got to revolt, Louisville. Louisville's time that we revolt. It's time for us to take the streets, take back our city. So we're, we're seeing that we, we're the majority. The, the Stephen Colbert, John Stewart fans, uh, liberals, non-Tea Party members. So we're creating multinational society. We want a multicultural, multinational society. Uh, a rainbow coalition, a rainbow rebellion. Uh, plus there's folks, you're coordinated coordinating with today you will be coordinating with them for many campaigns so you're building those relationships and struggles to come on it isn't just this one but there's gonna be many battles to fight it's Kentucky especially Kentucky it's a we got a buffet of problems okay we got insane people we've got heart problems we've got cancer problems we've got violent problems we got police problems we got prison problems we got meth problems we got unsolved murder problems we got problems up the fucking ass okay uh, but Kentucky, we've been here the whole time, so we've been survivors. We're all survivors. That's one thing we can give Kentuckians credit for. And there is, you know, a bias towards Kentucky. So, you know, while a lot of the stereotypes are based in, based in reality, some of the stereotypes are just fucking. They don't, don't, they don't get us. They don't understand us. We're unique. We, we're our own people. So what? So what? Good. I think it just drop the fucking racism, keep the uniqueness, and drop the racism. Then I think hillbillies will be okay. Drop the fuck, just quit being racist, hillbillies. Stop being racist, and I'll be like, hey, okay, and I'll listen to all the rest of the shit you gotta say. But you racist, I don't give a fuck about anything else you gotta say. I don't, I no longer respect you. So revolt, Louisville. It's time for us to revolt. So we're going to be coordinating with people. We're going to be building these relationships. In the post-revolutionary decade of 1848, little had visibly changed, and most historians had considered the white Arab Spring revolutions a failure since there was a lack of permanent structural change. When we uh, get structural change, that's when we're successful. Institutional structural change. 
So I had a friend that actually used to complain about some liberals who would feed the homeless on Christmas and make themselves feel good for helping somebody out for a day, but they didn't actually care about change. They didn't actually want to change the institutions of society. They didn't actually want to change in, in homelessness as an idea, as a concept altogether. Just have a place where there's a plenty of housing, plenty of food, and let people work their way out of that when they can. At the bare minimum, you got a right to life. Louisville should make a stand for life. We should make a stand for life on top of many other things. But the homelessness problem and the uh, uh, poverty problem in Louisville shows how capitalism is a failure. The system is broken because we got lots of poverty, lots of poor people, and no voters, no democracy. In the post-revolutionary decade after 1848, little visibly changed. Um, there's a lack of permanent structural changes. So far, Occupy Louisville hasn't proposed any structural change, nor have they stated their purpose, uh, and nor have they established any democratically elected leadership. Sam Tadros wrote an article called The Story of the Egyptian Revolution for two weeks. Calls were made using new social media tools for mass demonstration on the 25th of November. So for two weeks, the Egyptians were out on the street and saying, revolution, revolution, revolution. Well, there's going to be a revolution this November uh, um, all over the country, okay? The election is going to uh, reach a pinnacle peak when the 99% and maybe the Tea Party will all be out on the street. Everybody's going to be out on the street. 2012 is it's going to happen in Louisville. Now, the question is, what will you be doing during the revolution? Will you be talking bad about it the whole time and then reluctantly go out there? Or will you be interested and be listening to the people that are paying attention to these things? You should be paying attention to uh, uh, your liberal friends, especially right now. Uh, this Occupy movement is incredible. I feel like I've been validated. For I've been questioning things for like 15 years, but I've been questioning things on the, on the correct side. Uh, I'm not isolated. I'm not alienated. There's lots of people that's just like me, and there should be more people speaking out. We're Americans. We have the right to free speech and the protest and the assemble. We should be leading the country in these demonstrations. Look at our imagery. As soon as we pick up the Guy Fawkes mask, you got countries. I want to say Denmark. Uh, they had parliament, like uh, their their representatives in Congress all were got wearing Guy Fawkes mask. When fucking America does revolution, the whole world like loves the way we fucking do revolution. We do everything fucking sweet, so we'll keep on doing things fucking cool and awesome. America does does cool shit, so the Occupy is cool. It's just a fucking tent. And it's lazier than marching, but it's actually more profound because it's saying we are sitting here and we're staying here and we're not going to move. That's how you have a sit-down strike. That's how you take over the buildings. That's how you take over the factories. Um, that's how you stand up for yourself. It's what Rosa Parks did. I'm sitting here. I'm not in your face. I'm not threatening to knock your block off. I'm just sitting down. And that pisses you to fuck off, Mayor Fisher? Fuck you. You don't like a tent on your fucking lawn? Fuck you, city council. You want to vote against the public? Uh, uh, right to camp, the public's right to be able to peacefully assemble, even if it's overnight in a tent, fuck you. That's some bullshit. That's some dumb fucking bullshit. So no, no fucking city person is allowed to go camping. The city council is anti-camping. But a part of it makes me think they was just anti-homeless people. It was a fig leaf uh, for their anti-homeless and anti-protester perspective but they fucking over all campers if it's you camping under uh, public land under three acres you're out i think there's only one exception that they had mentioned uh, some forest some national forest so sam uh, todros wrote the article a story of the egyptian revolution observers dismissed those calls as another virtual activism that wouldn't result in anything so for two weeks the egyptians were calling for revolution but they said uh, nothing's going to uh, uh, result from this but underneath the surface, things are a lot different. There was a strong labor movement. There was strong, uh, the labor was involved. The labor organizations were involved. The college students were involved. Uh, the social media class, Gigi's social media class, uh, who uh, uh, authoritarian regimes, democratic institutions under, in, on, under democratic regimes, something like that. They took a class. They organized. They were they had solidarity. Observers dismissed those calls as another virtual activism. They didn't believe it was going to happen. The social media tools had given people something that they had lacked previously, an independent means of communication and propaganda. So both of them, you need, you need the uh, informed people 
of everybody that's going on, but you also need um, you know, a little bit of pizzazz, a little bit of, you know, I guess a little, a little song and dance along with the fact, hey, we, you know, the fucking world is burning, world, do you see what the fuck is going on, Rome is burning, yeah, we have war, there's poverty on the streets, Wall Street bankers are robbing everybody, nobody knows what the fuck is going on, it's pretty, pretty rough out here, uh, everybody's scared, nobody knows what, what's going to happen next, so, hundreds of thousands of young Egyptians in a matter of minutes were seeing the demonstration videos being uploaded on YouTube. The revolution was televised. It was televised on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. They saw the revolution. So, the revolution was televised. The revolution was YouTubed. Since a violent revolution would be a bloodbath, um, also, the Facebook was integral with the revolution. Even though the 26-page plan that the Egyptians had, they said, no Facebook and no Twitter. Don't put them out on Facebook or Twitter. You know, send them out by emails, so that way, you know, it's not so overtly obvious uh, what it is that we're trying to do. So that's an interesting, uh, a lot of people say Facebook is a Facebook revolution or Twitter revolution. They called some of the uh, uh, Moldova, In Moldova they called it a Twitter revolution because Twitter was used, um, but that's that's kind of not totally accurate since the people in charge actually were saying don't use the social those social media programs. Um, so revolt, Louisville. We need to revolt. Uh, uh, so a violent revolution would be a total bloodbath. There's no reason for the people to go violent. We should stay orderly and calm and peaceful. If we tried to go violent, they would know exactly what to do to us. They can't d disarm us with our jokes and our sarcasm. They can't take away our sarcasm and our jokes and our right to complain. We are allowed to bitch. We're allowed to bitch in America. That's one of our First Amendment rights. That's our first freedoms, right? Free speech, it's every, the dumbest motherfucking American knows that. You're allowed to say what the fuck you please. That's, that's an American right, okay? That's an American right. Say as the fuck you please. Bitch about whatever the fuck you want to bitch about. That's your right. Go ahead and bitch. So, the, um, we can talk, we can complain, we can make jokes, we can be sarcastic, but never go violent, because when you go violent, they know exactly how to respond to that, and that's all they fucking got. They got all these fucking guns, and all these people, and suits, and uniforms, and all this military equipment, segways, and horses, and ATVs, and riot sticks, and riot patrols, and a lot of plastic handcuffs, because they expect them to handcuff, like, fucking thousands of people, they, uh, doing martial law tactics on the street, they're learning how to oppress the American people, just like they was fucking fighting, um, the Iraqi people in Iraq, they will say insurgents, they ain't insurgents, they the people, and now they come back here and they look at us as the people to oppress too, it's very, it's not totally fascism, I don't see them marching in the street, but I see them marching in Anaheim, and I see them marching in any places where, the American people are finally taking a stand, and they're saying enough is enough. Canada's revolting. Mexico's revolting. America's not revolting. America's not doing our part. Why the fuck are we doing our part? Where the fuck are you, America? In Louisville, Kentucky. Man, we've been ready for a revolution forever. Hell, I was I was excited about the, uh, almost beating uh, UK with Rick Pitino. I mean, that would have been so sweet. Louisville beating UK with Rick Pitino at the helm. And it probably would have uh, uh, turned it, just like UK. UK was burning couches, and they had a good old time with their riot. So Lexington did right by winning the whole thing, and then they fucking started burning everything. Good for them. Good for you all. But I feel like the Louisville was right there. We were ready. We were ready, and then it was taken away from us, and it was real quiet, and nothing was going on. So um, since a, a violent revolution... It would be a bloodbath because, you know, they got everybody. They got the ATV, uh, FBI, Homeland Security, um, you know, everybody. They got uh, National Guard, Navy, uh, Air Force, the Border Patrol, uh, ATF, uh, uh, you know, just everybody. DEA, uh, the police, the security guards. Um, it's a very militarized place. They got lots of guns, and even if we had some of our assault rifle, you know, buddies, uh, the militias helping us, I, I still think, like, we would lose that battle. We would lose that battle. If you're going to go out, go out like David Koresh, but I, I'm not trying, I'm not recommending to go the way of Waco, okay? Don't be like Waco. We want to live. We don't want to die. So... Uh, is, is, I envision the revolution is, to not be violent, to be a peaceful revolution. Um, it has to be a peaceful revolution. And in order to achieve a peaceful revolution, it would be instructive to learn about the successful peaceful revolutions that we've seen that have taken place throughout the world. Two come to mind, the Velvet Revolution 
and the Egyptian Revolution. Now, a lot of people died in the Egyptian Revolution. I want to say like 1,500 people died, but they are calling it the Peaceful Revolution because there wasn't, there isn't like Syrian bloodbath on the street. It's not like every fucking day. It's not like Gaddafi. It's not like Hitler. It's not like they were just assassinating people. They're kind of outliers. Uh, and the Velvet Revolution, which happened in Czechoslovakia in 1989 after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Egyptian Revolution happened on January 25th, 2011. So Czechoslovakia, the Velvet Revolution, and the Egyptian Revolution. Those are the two peaceful revolutions we should learn from, I think.